I'm very pleased that you indicated that, that there may be something of a wider remit, because today particularly I want to talk to slightly more general issues, but I think that they are absolutely fundamental general issues if you're working from or on Africa. Um, so um, we may can pick up on some of those, those kinds of issues in, in questions, but as I'm speaking, if you aren't an Africanist, try and think about where you're coming from or speaking to. But if you are an Africanist, then particularly try and think of what I'm saying as pertaining particularly to the continent. And I think that may lead to quite an interesting dialogue. So the numbers that you've got before you, I'm a geographer, sorry, so I can't resist a few maps. Um, and those numbers are important. Now, in some ways, they don't give us <coughs> that many surprises. Uh, but what it is, is a map that gives you the population relative to geographical size. And what you will see is that there are some bulges in places that you don't always anticipate. So yes, China and India are big and everybody knows that. But so is Indonesia, and so is Nigeria, and so is Egypt. And in fact, if you had to do a per capita interest in what we write about, and you did Africa versus Europe, we should be writing an awful lot more. Uh, about Africa. We know that. <laughs> there are a couple of graphs to begin with and you know versions of them. But until such time as you can project where your own career is going to be and what's going to happen in the time frame in which you are <coughs> going to undertake professional practice, you will not get the significance of what you're saying. In the time that you are going out to be development planners or, the, or really are acting in a development planning capacity, the world does not only already become predominantly urban, even in the global south, but even in Africa, which we don't think of as a urban continent, the majority urban condition is going to be urban, just as indeed the BBC announced this morning that China has uh, released its figures indicating that it is now a majority urban place. And that's really, really significant. What it means is that what we've got is a mismatch. A mismatch from where the cities are and the places that we write about as urban scholars. And indeed, the places where we train urban professionals and the places from which urban consulting corporations, uh, big multinational urban planning agencies act. Okay, so you've got a real dissonance. And I think what it does, if you have a look at those numbers, is that it means that as a cohort of urban professionals, whether we're scholars or practitioners, we're extremely ill-equipped to deal with what the challenge is. And if you have a look at the graph, I mean, it's a no-brainer in terms of what the actual challenge is. Okay, so in the time that I was born, so here, to when I'm going to go float about, the urban challenge, the bottom two trajectories, okay, in other words, the places that have changed the most, Asia and Africa, have been the places about which we have seen progressively less per capita research than we have in the global north. And that's really serious. We're going backwards in terms of our capacity to address uh, the, those needs. And so, what I want to do is to, with that kind of stuff in mind, is to make a series of assertions. And the first one is really that what's happened, is, as the financial markets in fact have discovered, is that the locus of power, the locus, the, the demographic base, the transition that we've seen happening over the last couple of decades, which has shifted the hub of population from the north to the south, has profoundly changed what we do, how we do it, and <clears throat> and how we see things. And what's happening is that urban scholars and practitioners are struggling to catch up. Okay? We're kind of playing catch. We literally are playing catch up. And what it means is that we have to reconfigure what it is that we do in profound kinds of ways. And as most of us know, any resizing kind of exercise is not very comfortable. Um, and it's particularly uncomfortable for those who have done very well historically. In other words, firms that have had really large practices operating largely in the North American and, and European market, who suddenly have to begin to start operating in a global market where they are no longer the experts, it's uncomfortable. For scholars, 
who've written extensively and are well renowned for their expertise, which is real expertise, in the global north, but where the need, the demand, the imperative is now in the global south, there has to be a kind of a, a, a retooling, if you like. What I'm trying to say here is, is simply to, to, to flag the issue of the imperative as we begin to start this exercise of retooling, of reorientation, of undertaking what is probably going to be a very different kind of journey, what does it mean for us ethically? And today I'm proposing that we tend to focus, when you do research, some of your students in the room, I think not everybody, but some of your students, and when you're, you're doing postgraduate training, you'll do a research methods course, yeah? What you don't do in your research methods course is to ask what are the theoretical questions we're asking. And part of what I'm proposing today is that we have to do that. Because what we ask, theoretically, the kinds of work we set out to explore will influence practice. And that, therefore, we need to begin to start thinking terribly, terribly carefully about that. Later on, We'll make a series of points about interdisciplinarity, about transdisciplinarity, about the co-production of knowledge between practitioners and academics. All of this implies that the way that we are likely to retool is going to be fundamentally different. And I'm suggesting that we may need to pause to think about some of the ethical questions of who oversees that process, who reflects on what that means. Because some of the traditional disciplinary boundaries some of the traditional <laughs> methods, whether it's in quantitative survey research or whether it's in some of the in-depth work that we do, will fall by the way. Okay, as we're setting out on that journey, a number of people have already begun to ask a series of questions. And within the academy, from within the African continent, there are a number of different initiatives of people beginning to say, we have to do things differently. These are five propositions that come out of a piece that um, of some of our colleagues from um, the African Centre for Cities. And basically what they are saying here is, in a sense, we have to start to <coughs> over. And one of the questions we might come back to in our third session was, is, do we really have to do that? Is there nothing that we can reinvent? Okay, what do we take with us? Is it essential that we throw out, in a sense, conventional urban practices? The argument that's being made here is that what we have doesn't work. Okay? And because it doesn't speak to the complex realities of everyday lives. And as an alternative, the second proposition is that what we need is a theoretical praxis that is value-based. Which is quite counter to what we've heard in a whole lot of other places. Value-based, not just socially, but perhaps also uh, ecologically. Maybe we throw out propositions about growth, for example. What do we really know about what's going on in Burkina Faso? I don't know that. Okay. What do I really know about what's going on in the DRC? I don't really know that. We know very little empirically. Empirical work is incredibly expensive, very time consuming, and as a result, it's very difficult to use such generating theory. What it also implies is that what we need, if we're going to begin to start generating theory, is to move beyond case studies. We need to begin to start to think about what these different things mean in relation to each other, to compare for example, to generalize, a series of no generalization. Very difficult to do that if you have no robust systems to collect the data. So if you're trying to actually compare <coughs> unemployment levels in different African cities. Have you ever tried to compare population growth in different African cities? You can't, because the data's not there. It's not kept in the same way. It's not generated in the same way. So there's a huge institutional task associated with this retooling of this theoretical project that we are looking into. And of course, as I implied earlier, I'm inclined to think that engineers, architects, planners, developers don't have an individual purchase on some of those solutions, and so we need a wider cohort of interdisciplinary practice. So that's one set of ideas of what's going to be dealing, uh, is happening there. I want to take a, a more um, specific, and perhaps a little bit more provocative uh, take into how and what that means. Okay, so in thinking then about these big demands and how we begin to engage that, 
if we sit down to say, if all the stuff is so difficult, inappropriate, not particularly useful, how do we begin to change it? And in essence, this draws from some work Jenny Robinson and I have just put out, always coming out in the paper in urban geography. What we're arguing is that we need to provincialize some of the work of grand urban theory. Okay? And it, you know, urban theory changes at the moment. Whether it's the global cities literature, the gentrification literature, the literature on the critique of neoliberalism. Those are the things which kind of dominate the big urban study stuff. And what we're saying is, don't throw it out, but provincialize it. In other words, give it its place in a global context that uh, makes space for other possibly more relevant ideas to begin to emerge. But before we start arguing that the only thing that we have to do is to take pot shots at existing theory to demonstrate that it doesn't have global resonance, and that's easy to do, okay, for all the numbers reasons I've just indicated. I think we also need to be very reflective, particularly for those of us who engage directly with practice, because what we simultaneously need to be doing is what some of the people who were practitioners of the early 20th century and mid 20th century were doing. People like Howard, people like Unwin, who actually wrote about what they thought and did. In other words, practitioners generated ideas. So the slippage and the division between theory and practice is not solely the fault of academics who've moved into the ivory tower but it seems to be also the fault of practitioners who failed to be serious public intellectuals when they are at the top of their field. And we'll come to that. And so it seems to me that it's time to begin to start searching for what may be innovative ideas and innovative practice. Okay, so, <coughs> two acts. First act, how do we decenter the discourse on neoliberalism? And basically, before I do that, I just want to make, um, before anybody stands and says, bah, 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 this is my disclaimer. Okay, now we could do the same thing for the global cities literature, we could do the same thing for the gentrification literature. I don't think neoliberalism is a myth. I don't think neoliberalism has been a grand and wonderful force. I do think that there are some lovely things about the critique of neoliberalism that I'm about to savage for the next 10 minutes. Okay. Amongst those are the fact that, particularly at the global scale, it's very simple and redolent to see the impact of neoliberal tendencies, particularly in things like trade agreements. It is not difficult to find examples almost anywhere in the world where neoliberal policies, neoliberal practices have negative impacts, particularly on growth. It is particularly true that one of the most difficult things to push out of the way is what we might call a neoliberal rationality, where people don't even know that they've come to think about efficiency and effectiveness, and that they think that things like performance criteria are perfectly normal, sensible things we're putting in place. So I don't think that neoliberalism is useless. However, what we are trying to say is that the dominance of that rationality, the way that that critique, the number of students who come from the global north to go to the global south to go and find the neoliberal policies, which act up. Almost every article that you read talks about uh, the impact of neoliberalism. And basically what we're trying to say is that, in fact, it may well be that, particularly in the global south, Neoliberalism has actually been less significant than a number of other processes and it has existed alongside other drivers of change which haven't had the airtime because there's been so much attention given to questions of neoliberalism. And in fact there are probably some places where neoliberalism is actually not particularly important at all. And so there's, here's the suggestion is that neoliberalism may not be that useful for illuminating the conditions of, of poor cities. Particularly because, and particularly in Africa, where local states are so weak, underfunded, unimportant, underdeveloped. So the retreat to the state, one of the tenets of neoliberalism, is a joke. You can only retreat so far when you are of such a low base, yeah? when you're already incredibly weak. 
It's very difficult to identify neoliberalism as the dominant discourse in places where the configurations of power are not negotiated by the state. In other words, where real power relations lie in families, in indigenous politics, in the church, in any number of other places where there's a very, very different kind of discourse. Things, if you like, for uncovering uh, what is there. This isn't an, an African example, it comes from Ongsworth, Ongsworth on Asian cities, and I really like it. It's, it's not um, a particularly different argument from one that was made quite often about globalization, which is kind of actually, it's all very well to talk about global cities, but there are some places which are so in the shadow of globalization, where there are no international flight connections, where you don't get to cope, where you aren't exposed to a whole range of things, that actually process of globalization is not a useful lens for understanding what goes on there. And so too uh, with neoliberalism. Perhaps more interesting is, is um, James Ferguson's work um, on Africa. Um, and I think his argument is actually very provocative because he's looking at mining capital. And basically what he argues is that mining capital kind of is not pervasive. It creates particular little spots in identity and it creates a rationality that exists around it. It's often quite short in its temporal form, and it has a logic that has existed, in fact, for many years, whether you look at the copper belt in Zambia, or whether you're looking at Luanda and oil. It's a very similar kind of rationality. And basically, what he's suggesting is that what we've got is, if anything, it's an extractive neoliberalism. So he uses the label of neoliberalism. But it's a neoliberalism which he argues is really quite different from the neoliberalism that you may see in the southern US. So the example that I've added on to that, and if anybody's been to Luanda, where there's that city that's been built south of, this, uh, of, of Luanda completely, in fact, by Chinese money rather than, uh, uh, but private capital as an entirely separate community, this is not the same as what you're seeing in Miami, where you're seeing gated communities. So it's not one process, one phenomenon, one uh, form of, of, uh, of, of discussion. Um, so, if you carry on with that logic and you begin to start saying, so there are limits to this analysis of neoliberalism, and you start to think, yeah, okay, maybe I need to question this a little bit more. I think you can go quite a lot further. Okay. Um, uh, the picture's from Morocco, um, and for me, I've never been to Morocco before, and if there's anybody here, from that part of the world, but what was absolutely extraordinary to me was recognizing that in fact, just like this country, the power of royalty, particularly the power of royalty with respect to land, and thus to land development, was absolutely pervasive. Okay. So notions of neoliberalism don't fit very well under those kinds of constructions of power, those kinds of preconditions for development. And certainly across most of Africa, the story that is yet to be told in any fulsome way is the role of indigenous authorities. And so many people who are Asian specialists will say the same, particularly uh, for India. In fact, this discussion about neoliberalism for me comes out of exactly this. It comes out of reviewing papers which made the argument that the South African state, the South African local state, was a neoliberal state. And when you look at the evidence of the post-apartheid transition, which I'm not for a moment defending, in enormous errors, fundamental uh, misjudgments of all sorts of kinds, but one thing you cannot argue with is that the state has retreated. You certainly cannot make the case that there's been a reduction in welfare. There's been the deracialization of pensions, which has been a massive extension of welfare to the entire population on the basis of a universal allocation. There's been the extension of medical care. There's been an allocation of a massive housing grant and land grant to almost 2 million households with more to come. There have been profound interventions with respect to water and sanitation. And so the idea that the South African state is a neoliberal state in every essence of its being is empirically absurd. Okay. That doesn't mean to say that I'm saying that here a macroeconomic policy doesn't have some neoliberal tendencies in it. But the analysis where people have looked for and found what they perceive to be a progressive agenda 
it seems to me, has fundamentally distorted our understanding of the city and therefore the politics which is used to garner, to harness it, to take uh, a progressive agenda further. And interestingly, Theodore um, uh, Brenner, Peck and Theodore were perhaps the three most well known authors of, and, and very sophisticated, very useful authors who I think, particularly for urbanists, were very careful about disaggregating what was at the global, the national, and the local scale, that multi scalar understanding of neoliberalism. Really, what they're trying to do is to say, look, you know, neoliberalism lands differently in different places. Okay. Yeah, you know, it's a good point. You know, there's unintended consequences, there's local the context, there's all of those kinds of things. And their argument, therefore, is to say we should stick with the plot. Okay, let's stick with it and let's go look for wider and more diverse informants to this policy. And you might, you might want to go with that argument. Uh, Helga Leitner and others come back and say, you know, look, yeah, you know, neoliberalism is sort of one of a range of kind of evolving capitalist imaginaries and what we need to be able to do is to think about how we categorize those things and what's really important is to be able to say when something's neoliberal and when it's not, okay? But we need to keep looking for neoliberalism because that's probably what we're looking for multiple forms of and mutations of, okay? And basically what Jenny and I are saying is actually no. What we really need to do is we need to be stopping to pause to say, are we so busy seeking out, in this case, the search for a neoliberal agenda, that we are missing, we are not seeking evidence of different kinds that comes out of the diverse, very poorly understood physical, social and economic realities of the African city. And I go back to that point that I made before. You know, if you are working on Ugandan <coughs> cities, there are not 30 people writing on the same stuff as you are. And so it's quite difficult to ground truth. It's difficult to triangulate. And so ethically, it becomes imperative for the researcher to make sure that they're seeing not just what they went to look for, but also what might be staring them in the face that they have not uh, yet identified. And so that brings me to Act 2. Pause. <laughs> yeah? Okay. Uh, drinks. <laughs> okay. And here, I'm, this feels like one of those productions where, where you've kind of workshopped it, but it might go in a slightly different direction if you workshopped it with different people, yeah? Um, and what I'm suggesting here is that in fact, there are a number of different trajectories of ideas that I think are really useful, that we might pull on, that actually come out of what people have been writing on, that we could, if we sat down to coagulate, to generalize, to pull together, to reflect, to engage with, that we may well recognize as different theoretical entry points which would take us into a discussion about different kinds of solutions for cities as we begin to look at what the theoretical ideas mean about intervention. And the first is some of the development debates which have been applied at the urban scale. Now, development studies as a discipline has been really awful about engaging the urban. Okay? It's been caught in, in a very rural orientation. It's been caught very much around questions of agriculture, about peasantries, if you have a look at what the big debates that have been there. But there are some that are about to go into not trying to unpack those. The right to the city is another, that I think is a nascent uh, debate. And then the one that particularly interests me and which I'll try and tease into our lecture uh, next time to be more concrete about is the, the embryonic debate about the role of the state, and, and in particular the role of the local state. So, if we go back um, and have a look at some of the, the people who actually mm. probably would position themselves as development studies theorists or thinkers, and look at what they have written about the urban, and we say, has it helped us see cities, see urban problems, see urban solutions in slightly different kinds of ways? I think the answer is yes. Um, the, the, the group of people who I'm immensely grateful to, and I'm not sure they would ever see themselves as theorists, um, is I, are, are the group of people who work at IID, led by David Sutherland. Because for the last 30 years or so, what David has sought to do with his colleagues is to position the urban 
as a site of intervention, as a legitimate site of donor assistance, of community action, of political organizing, of state and, and institutional reform. And that's been done through a very active attempt simply to make the state legible. I mean, the city legible. Okay, in other words, how big is the urban population? What does it look like? What's its composition? How does it look? It's kind of, you know, you've got to really be committed to collect those numbers and put them in pretty graphs and talk about them in, in ways that, that make people go, oh my gosh, there's an urban transition going on. And I think IID has really been at the forefront uh, of that work. And, and for me, that's the foundation, if you like. Um, <coughs> what would be fantastic is if some of the big international agencies would actually galvanize behind them to ensure, go back to that first line and those five propositions, one of those propositions of saying we need more robust data about these places so that we can begin to start interrogating with much more seriousness what's really happening here. Are we informalizing or are we not? What is the nature of the unemployment problem? Is it just a youth bulge or are we actually seeing the informalization of work? We don't know, we can't say it because we don't have the data. So that's the first one. The second one involves people like Karen, sitting in, in, in the front seat, and I think that when we look back and we say, why and when did we begin to see what the real drivers were of inequality and poverty in the city of the global south, we will say that we began to understand it when we began to, we, as soon as we began to ask questions about gender. Okay. And there are two parts to that. Part of that is the question just about you know, classic gender training. Karen, can you remember it? What's the difference? What is gender? Okay, come, what's gender? Have you had that here? <laughs> You'll get there. I promise you. Do you still teach that stuff at DPU? Part of it, yeah. yeah, okay. So, go back to it when you do it. But it's, you know, <coughs> so it's not just about the difference between men and women, but it's about the institutional structures and the institutional systems that both create and embed differentiation and discrimination. Because what that work was able to do was it was able to identify urban processes that structured inequality. Okay. Theoretically, that's enormously important. Okay. Once you begin to start doing that, you begin to say, I understand how the city works. And you might be talking about race, you might be talking about gender, you may be talking about migration. They're the same things, but what the gender analysis did was that it was a cutting edge of saying, how do we begin to unpack this stuff? What his work was able to do was to say there are different experiences of poverty. Okay? And the lived experience of poverty covers my economic life, it covers my access to basic needs, but it also embraces, and she was reflecting what was written about widely at the time, by, by people like UNDP, but it's also, and we begin to see the origins of the work on social capital coming through, it's also about my capabilities, and that led absolutely into that very pervasive work uh, on livelihoods, assets, and capabilities. And Sam, who of course was given a Nobel Prize for his work, um, had no clue of what it meant for the urban. And I think Caroline Moses' work in particular, to a lesser extent perhaps Carol Cody, um, and uh, what's her name? Um, anyway, um, on translated what that meant and got some of the complexity of how people live in cities. And that complexity of understanding what it meant to be an urban resident, fighting for survival, a livelihood, and, and an, an enhanced capability, I think really began to help us unpack in ways that I'm not convinced even now that the neoliberal analysis does what cities need. And I think that work is the foundation for the work on vulnerability. So, very proud traditions never spoken of as theory. Almost always hidden in great literature and never articulated in contradiction or in distinction to any of the other big theoretical ideas. I'm not going to dwell on the stuff on the right to the city because I think that we're probably going to have a lot of material around it on, on that now. It is for me a very interesting set of work and um, it's particularly interesting because it's politically redolent at the moment and it's the first time for a very long time I have seen a theoretical concept or a utopian idea drive 
policymakers. It's been embraced by policymakers and academics almost simultaneously. It's not a new idea, it comes from Henry III, um, and, and, and to some extent, John Friedman, who's written about uh, the good city uh, much earlier. Their notions of what that urbanity means, I think, are very significant, because whereas they were writing about the meaning of being urban, what citizenship, in a sense, implied in its fulsomeness, has been translated, I think, into a very particular, almost sort of struggle-oriented, um, instrumentalist, and I'll say that in the positive sense of that, acquisition of rights through institutional gain, whether it's through the negotiation of the right to housing under the UN Framework Convention, or whether it's a uh, right to housing in, in a Brazilian statute, but, uh, or, or whether it goes beyond the right to water to the right to the protection of clean air. So there's been some very interesting work on this. I'm, I'm a little anxious about it because it's, it's almost taken so much. If you Google right to the city, and if you join up on the Google Alerts, I don't know if you ever do that, you can log on and, and you, you join Google Alerts, and join right to the city, but get off it. It comes too often. Okay. But, and that tells you that there's a story there that, in fact, it's not a concept that is cleanly and, and, and well defined. So, the last bit of this third um, thing I want to, to talk about is, is, for me, what's really fascinating. <laughs> because what we're seeing is a divergence and what I think is a fascinating dichotomy in the, in the literature. It's not a debate. Okay? Debate is when you say one thing, I say another thing, we have a debate, we have a discussion. Yeah? This is a development dialogue. We talk to each other. This is not a dialogue. This is one facing this way, and this is the other one facing this way. They're not talking to each other, they're talking past each other. But they are saying fundamentally different kinds of questions. But at the center of the question is the issue of what, with respect to the urban, is the role of the local state. I've, I've pulled out and I've to some extent caricatured, but only to some extent. So, bear with me while we read through the quotes. They say one thing on the one side and then one, another thing on the next side. So the first lot basically say, <coughs> when there's an urban crisis. We've got lots and lots of poor people, there's disasters happening everywhere. Oh my gosh, what are we going to do? We need more government. Okay? We at least need a minimum level of government. And you see that coming through in um, the UN's position on, on planning, which has changed really, really profoundly. Um, we're planning for the first time in many years, there's been a return to say, actually, that stuff we thought was really not necessary, we really do need to have some system of the allocation of land. We've seen it with respect to the right to the city, the really Brazilian statutes, a definition of what that means in a planning ordinance in particular kinds of ways. We've seen it uh, with respect to work making a case that government is an instrument of redistribution. Okay, So if you're going to get redistribution, you've got to have some form of government. You see that in the South industry in particular, in the developmental state. Lots of the climate change literature. Okay. Now, I don't think that, again, I'm not sure that they're, they're doing this consciously because an awful lot of people who are in... Better keep quiet. I don't know where are you. Uh, a lot of people who talk about climate change know nothing about cities and they certainly know nothing about development planning. What's interesting, though, is that when you push to say, so what are you going to do? The first thing is to say we need a climate adaptation plan. Who's going to drive at the local authority? All of those arguments are basically <coughs> saying the same thing. They're saying... In responding to the growth of cities, the transition to an urban society, we need more government. On the other hand, you have a whole lot of other people, mainly academics, mainly pure academics, most of the people I spoke about earlier are not, saying completely different kinds of things. Phil Amos famously says, the best thing government can do is nothing. Okay? The less they do, the less harm they'll do, nothing. Roy says it in even more <coughs> <coughs> acerbic kinds of ways. Speaking of India, she basically says an absent state is better than an interfering state. Informality works. It's the famous uh, reflection on, on, on Africa. Um, a few Prem Kulhaus endorses. Um, basically, the poor will organize themselves better 
than government. Less government is good for the poor. Government misunderstands, interferes, creates problems, and on the participatory processes, rather reject those invited spaces. These are spaces of compromise. Okay? Rather go for invented spaces. In other words, detour around government. Uh, so you can, what I'm trying to point out here is that there is not a consensus. Okay? This is a, a terrain which is highly contested if you turn these parties around to talk to each other, which they haven't been doing. But I think it may be useful for us in our dialogue to do, and I'm hoping that we can pick that up uh, in our next session, and that's my last slide, to say that when we do so, I'll try and lead you into that, looking at three issues, segregation, regulation, and land use change. But I'll leave it there for now. Okay, thank you. Thank you.